First thing I got to bring up is uh, I'm a huge fan of Alita. And I know that the chances of getting a sequel are low, but I want to know if you guys have considered um, doing like a comic book or anything that might talk about what would happen after the end of the first uh, film. Can't comment on that right now. But a quick <laughs> question. We'll skip on to the next one. <laughs> Got it. Um, I'd rather give you a real answer when I have a real answer. Right. I, I, I completely understand. What is the secret? Listen, Mike, my, my, this is going to be a huge, your movie uh, uh, is going to be a huge hit for Netflix. My, every kid that watches it is going to love it. Uh, yeah. You have a knack for making really entertaining kids' films. What is the secret to making a good kids' film? You know, it's a, it's a, I think it's because I'm from a family of 10 kids. I mean, that's huge. So if anyone looked at this movie, you'd go, I would not want to direct 11 kids in every shot like that. That would be 11 people in general. But that's how I grew up. So it was, it was actually easy for me. And then I have five kids of my own. Creativity and keeping a childlike sense of creativity has always been important in my life just to maintain staying creative. So it's pretty easy for me to do. I really enjoy it. I'm glad I, I've been able to make a success out of it because if you can make a success out of doing something that just comes naturally to you, then you never work a day in your life. So it's been really fun to make these kinds of films. I see the impact they've had on kids. Kids now they're in their 20s who grew up with it, tell me what it meant to them. And that's really incredible. So I, I want to continue that. And now with Netflix, I can reach more people all over the world on Christmas and they're going to enjoy it and they can watch it as many times as we want. And we'll be able to keep track of how many times they watch it. So then we'll know that the true success of it because you couldn't judge by kids or, you know, from its budget, from its box office because kids saw it again and again and again at home on video and nobody knew how many times. And it was a lot of times. So I was really excited to do one of these again. And use the totality of your creativity when you make this. You don't have to limit it to just adult ideas or, you know, for an action audience. This is, you can use your pure imagination and all the things you've learned from your children and teaching your children and playing with your kids growing up can go in these movies. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Did anything change with the powers and with the, with basically with the powers of the VFX as a result of, um, of, of VFX? Meaning like, did you have a power that you almost did, but you're like, that's going to be too much or too difficult with the VFX or was everything your original ideas exactly what was on the screen? You know, everything got super enhanced because when I was doing it originally, I was trying to keep my budget in mind. I had, a, you know, I, I wanted to be a hero over there at Netflix. I said, I'm going to get less than you usually pay for a movie. I'm going to deliver you something that looks three times bigger. That way I work forever here. I want to make a bunch of these. <laughs> so, um, but then uh, I was, I knew it was limited in the effects. So a lot of the ideas are really creative, like rewinding time. All you do is rewind footage that you've already shot. It doesn't cost anything. It's a $2 trick. There's a lot of $2 tricks in the movie. But for the other effects, Weta, who had worked with me on Alita, really loved that experience and wanted to continue the relationship. And I said, I can't afford you on this movie. And they said, it's okay. We'll do it for whatever you have. So I had these bonkers effects that I was not expecting, was not requiring and the movie just got elevated because of what they brought to it. So I can't thank them enough because you watch it and you're like, where did all this come from? Right. It doesn't look anything like I get movies. Those are the, but that's the budget I had. And I got these effects instead. So yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to them. So they, they were able to accomplish everything that I wanted and then some. Um, so I didn't have to change any ideas. Actually, I got to just enhance things along the way. If anything, I am sure that, as I said earlier, this is going to be a huge hit for Netflix um, the thing about kids is they grow very fast. So where are you in the development of a sequel? <laughs> well, um, if this movie does well, I've already got ideas in mind because we'd have to jump right into it. But it, we don't we're not uh, we don't have firm plans to do anything yet. But they're definitely looking to see how, how this does. They think it's going to do well. But until it really does come out, you can't really bet on that. But um, I'm hoping it does well. So everybody see it on Christmas Day. So we got to see do you see yourself uh, helming a sequel? Do you see it? Um, do you see it like as a family? Helmet. Yeah, I, I love making these, and I shoot very fast. And you have to have somebody that really knows what they're doing because having that many kids, you've only got them for six hours. You got to shoot them in six hours. That's half a day. You got to really know what you're doing. So that's why I operate the camera. That's why I'm DP. That's why I'm the editor. I used to be the composer too, but then my son kicked me out of that job. He, he did better than I did. He took over. I lost that job now. So, but um, it's, uh, you've got to just be on it and, um, and you can't, you can't phone those things in. You've got to be there hundred percent to make them work because it's, uh, 
it's tricky, you know, it's tricky to, to make that many kids work in a, in a movie. And then we'll probably just be adding characters in the sequel. So yeah, I really love them enough to, that I'd want to help. Was it always going to be this title? Did you have something else in mind? It was always that title. And I came up with it actually in the room when Scott Stuber said, we'd like a family series from you of some kind, you know, like movie, like you did with Spy Kids. And I thought, no one's, I can't believe all the superhero things they've done. Movies, TV shows, spinoffs, side characters. No one's done one with kids. So that's for sure. And I had just been listening to that song and I thought We Can Be Heroes is a great title because it's saying that we can be heroes too now, finally, when it's just been nothing but adults, but also adults would have recognized the reference and think that that's cool. So it kind of worked on, on multiple levels. Um, I have to switch subjects because I thought you did a great job on Mandalorian, which just, oh, thank you. Which just yeah. played a few days ago. What I'm curious about is, did you have a lot of deleted scenes when you shot that? Because there is no set runtime that they have to release. So, like, how does it work in the editing room? Um, no, I mean, the script was really short. The script was much shorter than the, than the episode. The script was like 19 pages. So that suggests 19 minutes. So I added a lot of action to just, I mean, in fact, I even asked John, I said, um, is it okay that my script's only 19 pages? Is it okay? Because I cut really fast and it's probably going to end up being 16 minutes. Right. I was do we need to add more pages? And he goes, no, that's what you're here for. You're going to need to fill it out. <laughs> so I thought, oh, okay, I'll try and make that battle longer. So that's where a lot of that extra battle came from. It was just trying to not, because I knew my tendency was to cut things pretty tight. So I thought, if I have a 100-page script, it's a 90-minute movie. So I had a 19-page script. I thought, whoa, I'm going to run out. I'm going to run out of things. So I added a lot of action. Um, what did it mean to you? Because you got to be the one who introduces the Slave One to the series. Um, what did it mean to be bringing back Boba Fett and Slave One? Because um, obviously you must have grown up with all this. Oh, but this was, that was my 12-year-old dream. You know, um, like when I was 12 is when Empire Strikes Back came out. And I was a huge Boba Fett fan. Because, you know, it was, they would tease him out before the movie came out. You already knew who was going to be a character to watch before they, the marketing was really great. Like this character, Boba Fett. And so when you saw the movie, you couldn't wait to see him. Um, so he captured your imagination before the movie even came out. It's all we were talking about at school. I still remember that, how, how mysterious that character was. And you got a little taste of him, but you were waiting to see more. So yeah, when I saw the script, John sent me the script and it said, you know, Boba Fett and Dark Troopers and Mando and Fennec. And I was just like, this doesn't even feel like a real script. It feels like a fan wrote this in a fever dream, hoping that this would be an episode. And yet this was the script. It had all the good stuff in it. Uh, it was like a greatest hits of all the cool stuff. I couldn't believe I got that gift to go play in Star Wars with all the, the toys and to get to play with Boba Fett as one of your main ones. I just thought I, I got to go in there and, and just have him be, I don't know if he's going to show up in any more episodes or what. So I got to just make him super badass in this moment, be that character that I imagined it being when I first heard about him when I was 12. That, that, that was my mission just to go satisfy that 12 year old uh, fascination with the character. On that note, I gotta go. Congrats on everything. Uh, wish you nothing but the best. Appreciate it, thank you.